Thanks for clicking on to Bogan's European Outlook for Monday the 14th of November. A very interesting article just released by Severe Weather Europe talks about the Tungahunga uh, volcanic eruption, almost a, a kind of explosion, if you will, that um, took place back in January at the very beginning of this year. I happened to be in, in Lanzarote at the time when it happened. And uh, if you can remember back to then, we seen the eruption that um, that basically created shock waves around the world, and we've seen um, multiple waves, shock waves, um, kind of coming away from that location and circling the world several times over. Um, and it was, of course, quite the event. But um, this article actually talks about the tremendous release of water vapor along with other uh, particles that re uh, reach the, the you know all the way up to 36,000 feet within the atmosphere or uh, should I say 36 um, miles within the atmosphere should I say so this is a subject that I'm not overly familiar with if I'm being honest so forgive me if I am incorrect in what I'm, I'm about to say but uh, certainly in this, by reading this article, they talk about the release of water vapor into the upper reaches of the atmosphere. And it's a, it's a, basically a, a water vapor cloud that continues to kind of circle the planet. And in turn, we've seen significant cooling, stratospheric cooling within the southern hemisphere and leading to... A, a stronger than normal stratospheric polar vortex over Antarctica and also the middle latitudes of the southern hemisphere have been seen um, significantly colder than normal temperatures. But this release of water vapor makes me think that, um, you know, has it contributed to an extent to the very, very warm summer across the northern hemisphere? I don't know. Um, but what this article goes on to say is that, um, and the point of the article from what I can see from it, it talks about how it's, it's created stratospheric cooling over the southern hemisphere uh, and especially over the pole and the mid latitudes of the southern hemisphere. And what that's done is it's led to, a, to an extent, co a warming of the surface temperature and I, I kind of think actually because of course if you've got a a, a, a cooling of the the polar vortex within the northern hemisphere over the arctic region that tends to lead to stronger westerlies a stormier pattern and also a warmer pattern um but what it, what the article goes on to say is that with um, a cooling of the stratospheric polar vortex over the Arctic, uh, over the Antarctic, sorry, that sometimes weakly can be linked to a weaker than normal polar vortex over the northern hemisphere. So in turn, with that would beg the question: Do we do we have the potential increased potential of stratospheric warming and even a sudden stratospheric warming event? during the upcoming winter season so it's a very interesting article i will share the link in the description below so please check that out and even what i'm saying correct me if i've, I've misread it but in turn what it's saying is that it's released a tremendous amount of water vapor into the atmosphere and um caused a degree of warming down uh, at, the, at the surface makes me question whether it's 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 enhanced the warming within the northern hemisphere but also there's a possible link to uh, a, a weakening a weaker stratospheric polar vortex within the northern hemisphere this upcoming winter season so when it's a stronger pv over the antarctic possible linkage to a weaker pv over the over the northern hemisphere here and that is what this article kind of goes on to say but it, like i say well worth a read please do so because if this is somehow correct this could certainly make for very interesting times later down the road you can see here if you look at the 
the Antarctic Oscillation, it has been firmly positive. So that would indicate that cooler stratospheric polar vortex and leading to uh, colder temperatures within the stratosphere over the South Pole. Um, and interestingly enough, the, the Arctic Oscillation has in a sense been fairly negative if you notice here during uh, really from the end of summer or the middle portion of summer in fact all the way way right through uh, September we did see a rise in the in the Arctic oscillation during the first half of October even into the second half and into the month of November and then, of course in turn we have seen some exceptionally warm temperatures um, lately here if i skip through this is the two meter temperature anomalies by the way for the for the planet uh, from the beginning of this year and you can see the tremendous amounts of warming taking place uh, across europe asia within the arctic region if you notice here colder across um, both south america and north america and interestingly enough by the way there could be some sort of a linkage here to the la nina holding on with the increase in water vapour as well. So these are all very interesting aspects. Would we have would we have seen a three-year La Nina if this volcanic eruption, explosion, whatever you want to say, didn't happen back in January? So is there some sort of linkage between Enzo and that event back in January? as well as the release of water vapour into the atmosphere and indeed the temperature profile of both surface mid-levels and the upper levels of the atmosphere. But if you notice here that as we progress through the spring into the um, into the summertime in particular, we're seeing a lot of warmth over, over Europe, over, over parts of uh, Eurasia. Has it increased the rainfall over northwest India and Pakistan? Remember back the major floods that we've seen over northern India as well as Pakistan. Is there a linkage with that um, event back in January to the rainfall in this region of the world? Of course, we're seeing the tremendous rainfalls across southeast Australia. We've had a cold in normal Africa. And uh, is all this linked up? Is it all this tied in? That is certainly a good question. But of course, we've seen a very warm summer across many portions of the Northern Hemisphere. And then this is, of course, September, uh, October, and in, into November so far. We've got a lot of warmth here across the high latitude region. Is this a direct response to the Tunga Hunga eruption back in January? That is the big question. But the Arctic Oscillation, as you can see here, is expected. Now, there's a... I'm confused a little bit, if I'm being honest, by the fact that the polar vortex, to an extent, is, is looking very healthy, it's looking very strong. There is some stretching going on. There's a piece of that expected to go closer to Canada, the United States. It looks as if the models are indicating colder conditions into the United States. Well, we know that there, there's, there's colder conditions coming into the United States uh, through the course of this week here. The... But the Arctic Oscillation is expected to go negative here and the North Atlantic Oscillation trending more and more negative as well, which is quite interesting. If you look at the CFSV2, by the way, you can see that it is indicating some very interesting things. Now, remember the Manjulian Oscillation progressed in 6 and 7. We've seen the tropics become active once again and I've alluded already to the fact that September's pattern could repeat itself later in November, early December and whatnot. And but look at the CFSV2 500 millibar uh, geopotential height anomalies here. So this is week one. Still got the strong tr uh, trough extending from pretty much North America into the UK. There's that building area of high pressure. Remember the high pressure over Europe has been very strong, but with this push from the Atlantic down into the kind of middle altitude region, is it forcing the area of high pressure northwards? Up in the Scandinavia, possible linkage between the Alaskan Ridge and the Scandinavian Ridge so that bridges the region. And but it's it doesn't shut down the Atlantic. We still have an Atlantic jet stream, albeit it's getting pushed further south. 
because of the building heights further north here. But watch this. Week two, week three. Notice here that we do start to weaken the trough stretched out, elongated between North America and Europe. But look at the building of pressure. We're seeing that bridging, that um, buildup of high pressure over the Arctic region. So the question is, where does the trough set up? I remember we've seen a lot of rain in recent times as well. So that is um, worth paying attention to. I'm kind of throwing this out here. It may be a little bit mix and match. Might not make a great deal of sense, but these are just simply ideas that I'm putting out here. All very interesting stuff. And it's just, to me, the, the article that's been written by Severe Weather Europe has almost threw, thrown a spanner in the works to my winter forecast as well. Because it's like, oh, I never really thought about that one about the effect of that with the atmosphere, the cloud of water vapor circling the planet, the cooling of the stratospheric polar vortex over the South Pole, possible weakening of the, the, the Northern Hemisphere polar vortex. Could that be an element that, that we need to consider? It is an element that we need to, we need to consider as well. By the way, in yesterday's uh, video, there was a couple of key things I forgot to mention when it comes to the type of pattern that we're seeing this month versus similarity to 2011. Now remember, 2011 were very, very much on par with the solar situation at the moment. And also, of course, I spoke about the very stormy conditions that were seen during the December. I failed to make mention of the fact that that was a, you know, a multi-year La Nina period, as well as the solar cycle being similar to now. So there are so many things to look at. You know, we've got the West of the QBO uh, this upcoming winter season, but there is so many different aspects to look at. You can't just look at the QBO, the, the Indian Ocean Dipole, the Arctic Oscillation, North Atlantic Oscillation, the sea surface temperatures. Like I said in last winter, it was a bust. Everything looked as if it was coming together, and yet it never materialised. So, um, so yeah, um, certainly there's a lot of things to consider when it comes to the long-range stuff. But certainly it's looking interesting. CFSV2 definitely showing a buildup of pressure over the Arctic region. If you look at the, um, the 10 millibar um, stratospheric polar vortex, we've got a fairly strong one at the moment, as you can see here. And even if you look all the way out to 360 hours, the 10 HPA level looks very, very similar to what it looks now. This is going all the way out to 360 hours, by the way, very little difference. But remember, the, the 10 millibar level is very different to the 50 millibar level, which of course is a lower portion within the atmosphere, closer to the troposphere. And when you look at the temperature profile of 50 millibars, so the lowest portion of the stratosphere into the upper troposphere, that is what more dictates our type of weather pattern. That's you getting close to the 500 millibar level. And then, of course, that is our weather. That is our portion of the atmosphere that um, creates weather for us down here at the surface. But if you look at the 50 millibar level versus the 10 millibar level, a very different look altogether. And that is what makes it a very complicated thing indeed. So to sum up this video, uh, probably a ramble, and if it is, I do apologize about that. To sum it up, a little spanner in the work, so to speak, the Tonga Hunga, the volcanic eruption, has led to a, a cloud of water vapor circling the planet, continues to do so as it is at the moment. That, that has led to significant cooling within the Antarctic uh, you know, polar vortex, if you will, and there is weak linkage to the potential weaker northern hemisphere polar vortex later down the road. So we'll watch that space as we go forward. But I do appreciate you watching as always. Please hit that like button. Share with your friends and family. And of course, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel. It is free of charge. And um, I do appreciate it. Daily content continues we are getting closer and closer to the winter of 2022-23. So stay tuned. Hope you enjoy the rest.